All right. I understand this is what we have. To, uh, I think all the members that are going to be present are present this morning. So let's go ahead and call the special committee to inquire into the circumstances and investigation of the death of Ronald Green to order. Turn myself off. All right. All right, no problem. I got it. All right, at this time we'll uh, we'll call the roll. Representative McGee, Representative Jordan, here. Present. Representative Bakla, here. Present. Representative Hughes, here. Present. Representative Landry, Representative Marcel, Representative Nelson, here. Present. Representative Villio, here. Present. Five members present and a quorum. All right. All right. We have Representative Hughes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Um, I, I just wanted to, you know, briefly, um, first of all, uh, thank uh, Chairman McGee in his absence for his leadership of this committee and um, the dedicated service of um, everyone um, that has um, put in a lot of sweat equity on this critically, critically important committee. Um, but I think we're now at a point, Mr. Vice Chairman, where I think we owe it to the public and we owe it to ourselves to uh, determine where are we headed from here, what is our end goal, and do we have a timeline when we're going to wrap the work of this committee up. So just wanted to um, put that out there for uh, discussion. Thank you, Representative Hughes. Anybody want to follow up and comment on that? Representative Villio. Thank you, Mr. Acting Chair, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I do not disagree with Representative Hughes. Um, I do know that um, we did receive a letter from the Governor's Council um, acknowledging our request for the Governor's testimony and, and for her testimony, um, but I understand they were not invited till perhaps last week. Um, and we're unavailable today, so I think we owe it um, to them to at least give them the opportunity um, to appear. But outside of that, I, I share your sentiments, Representative Hughes. Um, I, I think with today's testimony, perhaps we're in a position, and, and we'll hear from Colonel Davis, as I understand, and from Ms. Harden, I think we're in a position um, to perhaps um, wrap things up and, and, and put a report together. That's not my call. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Thank you, Representative Villio. And, and let me just say, Representative Hughes and to Representative Villio, I certainly agree with you, and I think we need to uh, have a path forward. Um, I think it's, it's, it's more than past time that um, we owe the Harding family. I see Ms. Harden in the uh in the room and i can tell you for myself and i know for some other members here uh one of the reasons we decided to serve on this committee was to make sure that miss harden had some type of closure uh to the death of her son and finding out what is going on so i can tell you i know we we do want the governor to testify we do want the general counsel to testify i for one have asked for bob brown to come and testify and i don't know if he'll appear or not but um, but those witnesses, I think, at a minimum, we should get testimony from. Uh, but we shouldn't have to wait, you know, all year to do that. So I think we need to coordinate that in short order, because I can tell you, if Ms. Harden can drive to all these meetings from Florida, uh, other people, I'm sure, can rearrange schedules and do what they need to do to get here. So with that being said, um, we have two witnesses, uh, and we'll start with Colonel Lamar Davis. Good morning, Colonel. 
Good morning, Mr. Acting Chair. Good morning, committee members. Uh, Colonel Lamar Davis, Deputy Secretary of Department of Public Safety Services, uh, Superintendent of Louisiana State Police. You have any statements or are you just here for questions? Uh, actually, both. Um, before I begin, um, I do want to again acknowledge Ms. Harden and, and the Green family. Um, there, there's nothing I can say here today that will fill the hole in their hearts. Um, as I've said, day one, my heart goes out to them. There's not a day that I that goes by that I don't think about this. I don't think about Mr. Green. I don't think about our involvement. I don't think about their pain. And I want them to know, and I want you all to know that every day that I come, every day I put this uniform on, every day that I come to work, I come with the primary purpose of making our agency better, making us an agency that not, a, not only that everybody can be proud of, but that we can provide a service to all of our citizens, all of our visitors. And I want everybody to feel comfortable when they see our uniform that we're going to provide that service. We're going to help them. And that's what I need everybody to know. Uh, with that said, um, you know, since being here two years, uh, I've done extensive and I continue to um, do extensive assessment of our organization. And during that time, there is obviously many things that I found that we could do a lot better. Uh, and I can go down the list. I will cover some of those major uh, aspects of it. But during that time, I have worked not only individually and worked with my leaders, but worked with other organizations to get an assessment done. Everyone knows that we have DOJ that's conducting the patterns in practice. Uh, that's no secret. But I've also took it a step further. Uh, I've commissioned an organization to come in and do a top to bottom assessment of our organization. And that's because I believe that that's what's best. Um, not only from my experience, whether it be militarily or recently or back then when I came on this organization, we were getting assessments conducted. And those were some of the foundations that allowed us and assisted us in becoming an agency that we, we built. But with that, I know that that information is going to help us move forward. And not only just move forward, move forward with best practices, move forward with doing things in a manner that is consistent with what our communities expect, what our leaders expect and so forth. Some of those things that we've done is I've reviewed our policies and, and quite frankly, there is a lot of work to be done with our policies. Um, there are some gaps within how we were administering policies and expecting people to abide by those policies without conducting that training. And I've since commissioned and created a policy section, expanded that policy section so that we can have people that that is their primary job, not just another job of many others. Um, we've also looked at our use of force and in, in, in the administration, the processing of our use of force procedures. And that's another area that, again, that we're working to build and not just build broadly, I mean specifically ensuring that our personnel complete the forms that they're supposed to complete, ensuring that our supervisors are holding them accountable and then we're holding our supervisors accountable. And as we do that, then what you see is a better interaction with our, our citizens. You see more accountability throughout our section. You're going to see more transparency throughout our agency. And those are just some of the areas that we are working on. But beyond just the use of force area, we're looking at our entire department. We're looking at promotions. We're looking at hiring. We're looking at every aspect of our agency. And again, as we begin and continue to improve those areas, then what you will find is you will get better interactions with the, our communities. I tell our personnel that every interaction that we have is an opportunity for us to change lives. We can't go out there with the idea that it's us against them, that we are different because we're the same. We just happen to wear a uniform. We just happen to be trained in what we're trained in. But it's important for us to go out there with the mindset and with the heart of compassion and empathy to ensure that we are providing a service to our communities. And as we do that, then what you'll find is we begin to impact lives, change lives, and save lives. And that's the ultimate goal of what we do. So in 
again, my last two years, I've really worked hard at really emphasizing that. Some of the other areas that I really wanted to tap into was really implicit bias training and some of those other areas to allow us to tap into resources and understandings of different cultures. And I think that's important because as we've seen and anyone that's traveled Louisiana, they will tell you that every hour you travel, regardless of direction, you, you're you going to change a culture. You're going to change cultures. And as you do, then as state troopers, then we have to be prepared to actually interact with those cultures and do so in a positive manner that elicits a positive outcome. And I believe that as we do that, again, we save lives. And, and that's the ultimate goal of what we should be doing is saving lives. So by bringing those trainings and not just implicit bias training, that's not where it stops. We're building our de-escalation program. We've been actually um, since being appointed, we've uh, applied for and been um, accepted into Georgetown Law's um, de-escalation program, their ABLE program. And I think this is something, once we get it throughout the agency, that will further assist us in growing our personnel, growing our response, growing how we interact with our, our citizens, and then from there getting and eliciting those positive outcomes. Um, we are a very good organization. We have men and women that will go and do things and run to a fight and run and put themselves in harm's way when many others wouldn't. And I applaud them for that. But as the leaders of this organization, it's our responsibility that we give them the tools, we give them the resources, we give them the support, we give them the training, and we give them the expectations on how they are to do that. And I hope that you all have and continue to see that's exactly what I'm aiming to do. As I mentioned before, every day I come to this job, I come with the main mission of making our agency better, making our individuals better, making our troopers better, and then creating an atmosphere where we're working with our communities, not working against them, but working with them so that we can all keep our communities safe. And that's, that's what we've been doing. As we move forward, one of the main premises that I really wanted to emphasize on our agency is accountability. So one of the best ways that we've been able to do that is really by increasing our technology. Uh, we have since created a computer-aided dispatch for our entire agency and rolled it out to our entire agency. And for you as leaders and for our communities, what that does is that account creates accountability at the lowest level of our organization. Everything we do is captured in that system, okay? But that also creates transparency. It helps us report back to you our activity, how we're performing our jobs, who we're stopping, how we're stopping them, and so forth. We did not have that capability prior to. Every, things were done on a spreadsheet. Things were sometimes not done at all and documented. And, and that's part of that change that we have to continue to forge, but not just with a computer-aided dispatch, a statewide records management system, also a e-crash solution for the entire state, for our entire agency, and a e-citation. And all of those systems, again, has the capability of creating statistics, creating a story and telling what we're doing, how we're doing it, how often we're doing it. And it gives you that information as our leaders gives our citizens that information. And by the way, we are going to make that information public. Okay. Um, that's one of the main areas that we're working on as well as transparency and building those platforms and building reports that would be public facing. So that is forthcoming along with these systems as we continue to implement these systems. I wish I could tell you that we, we are here today. We're there today. We're not. Um, we have, in a matter of three to four years, implemented more technology than most agencies do in seven years. But we're still not there yet. But I can assure you that is the pathway that we're moving. And as we do so, then you, my hope is that you all will feel comfortable that we're doing what we're supposed to be doing, how we're supposed to be doing it. I would ask this. Um, we, as I mentioned before, have a ton of men and women that go out there and they sacrifice their lives. They sacrifice times with their family. They sacrifice a great deal to perform this job. 
And I can assure you, I'm so fortunate, so happy that we have those men and women that are willing to do that. I ask that you all support and continue to support them. I ask that our communities continue to support them in performing that critical mission. Public safety, and, and, and we've said this before, is not a police-only job. It's not something that we can arrest our way out of. And what you will find with me, what you will find with my administration, what you will find with my agency is that we're not taking a only law enforcement approach. We're working with our communities. We are in our communities. We are volunteering with our communities. And we're working with our communities to ensure public safety. And we're working with all of our communities. So I, I really want you all to know that's where we are headed. Um, there are some things that since I've come on, quite frankly, I didn't like. I didn't like that we didn't have consistency. I didn't like that we didn't have accountability throughout our ranks and throughout our leadership. And I made changes by changing the people, not only changing the people, but changing the policies and not only by changing the policies, but also continuing to reevaluate so we can continue to make changes. And as we do that, then we're going to be that great agency that we have the potential of being. So, again, um, my heart goes out to Ms. Harden because I hate that it took this for us to be moving in that direction. I hate that it took this for us to be making the changes that we're making, but I can assure you that we're making them. And I will not rest until we continue to be in the agency where we should be. So with that, Mr. Acting Chair, I open the floor for any questions. Thank you, Colonel. Representative Bacala. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. First of all, let me preface my, my statements by saying that I don't think in the legislature you'll find a more supportive guy of law enforcement than I am, uh, having served 37 years in law enforcement myself. And I see my vice chair comment. Equal. Equal is uh, Representative Villio uh, in her support, right? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, Colonel, I, you know, one of the things that was encouraging throughout these hearings was that I think most of us here uh, who participated in this, this uh, process have heard from dozens and dozens of line troopers. And most of the state troopers that we talk to uh, who, are, who are not in positions of administrative authority uh, were supportive of this committee. And I think it speaks highly of the, the average trooper coming to us and saying, there are problems that need to be fixed. We are as embarrassed as anyone about what our fellow troopers uh, are doing. A and honestly, one of the impressions that we get in talking to the, the line state trooper, the guy who's out there every day that you're talking about putting his life out for his community, uh, leaving his family life, working long, hard shifts, those guys are the ones who point out more than anyone the deficiencies of the administration of the department. They're the ones that are coming back and talking about our reputation is being ruined and there's a lack of accountability, not because the line trooper doesn't want it, because those in administrative positions weren't pressing it. So I, I am complimenting the troopers that you complimented, but in a different way. More than anyone, those troopers say, we need, to, we need changes in this department if we're going to continue to be the, the premier law enforcement department of the state of Louisiana. Something got to change at the top. And I'm just being frank with you. That's what I heard over and over again. And I could get more specific, but some of them were very specific about specific individuals who weren't doing their jobs at the top. They all knew it. Now, we're talking about, you know, as you talk about, you know, implementing all these programs, I'm a little more simple than that. There was an attachment. Uh, you know, basically the entire investigation of Ronald Green was left in the hands of sergeants. Uh, with very, and, and we've had the opportunity now to re, to review the journals. Other than the first few days after the incident, there were no entries. There, were, there was apparently it went for 
an extended period of time outside of the first month window or whatever with no one getting an update even or passing on an update. And it's that indifference toward the investigation that's disturbing to me. The other part, and I understand that there could be some complications, the, you know, the, the flu, uh, poisonous fruits issues with sharing of information between the IA and the criminal, but the fact that there was no communication between IA and criminal, if there had been, the investigation would have been complete. The, the, we, we, there wouldn't have been any videos that, that went undetected, and we could talk about that at length. But, uh, look, to me, the simple things to fix early, I don't need an outside entity to come in and say the colonels and the lieutenant colonels should be engaged in a criminal investigation that leads to death, that you should be reviewing everything, ensuring that uh, uh, information is shared. I, I, I'll, I'll kind of slow down a little bit. And, and say that, aside from that, how many warning signs do you need before this incident happened, before you act? You know, so we can talk about all these things, but some of it, it is guys in positions of authority just doing their job. And if you don't do your job, the agency going to fall apart. And that's what I think, you know, we could go on and on, and I could go through a litany of things where I think there were failures. But at the end of the day, people didn't care enough. Let me just say, I could not agree with you more with regards to uh, those failures you spoke of. And, and really the trooper's viewpoint, you know, since being here, I've gone to every troop. I visited every shift. I have nine troops across the state. I visited every shift and I spoke with them in a small team setting because I wanted to get a good answer. Oftentimes, and, and you've been in law enforcement at a high level, oftentimes it's difficult when you come with an entourage of your senior staff for them to talk and want to be honest and upfront. And I've visited those troops with the idea of getting that information. And I've gotten a lot of that information. And now we're making those changes. Accountability is huge especially supervisory accountability. And I've taken that seriously. With regards to any reports now, I've changed and created a force investigative unit that reports directly to me. We've set those patterns, we set those, those, um, those processes in place, those policies in place, but more along the lines, we're educating our personnel and then from there we're responding. And I am the one where the buck stops. So I am reviewing reports, I'm reviewing videos, and I am making decisions. But I'm also holding our sub subordinate supervisors accountable. And I have since administered discipline because some, quite frankly, haven't performed their jobs as they should. Well, let me, let me inject, and I'll, I'll go back to probably the, the prime example, is you have a, a use of force uh, a trooper assigned use force, I can't recall his name, who, who reviewed the tapes, he described them most horribly, uh, you know, the tape of the incident with Green. Mm -hmm. So you have a trooper. He's not a, he's not a lieutenant. He's not a sergeant. Uh, if I recall, he said tortured murder. Mm -hmm. A trooper saying it, who feels so strongly about it, upon viewing the, the videos, and yet again, there's a detachment. If he felt that strongly, and look, I, 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 whether we share his opinion or not is irrelevant. What we should know is that that trooper's assessment didn't make it up the chain to the colonel. And I don't even know who at the highest level actually viewed the videos. Uh, let's be clear. Even who at the top Knowing the videos existed, knowing even a trooper looks at these videos with such disdain, and apparently nobody at the top, at the highest level of the organization, even bothered to look at the videos. And to me, that is an outright 
Well, I, I, I won't even characterize. I'll let you comment. Well, and I wish I could, I could answer that and provide you an answer, but unfortunately I wasn't the superintendent at that time. And I can't speak for the prior superintendent. Um, I can tell you now as we move forward that I am taking those matters seriously, that I am accountable to them, and I'm, not, I'm also holding my supervisors accountable. So I can assure you that we are doing that now. Uh, let me just let my colleagues, while I, yes, I, I'll, let them, I'll let them ask a few questions. I'll, I'll come back. I want to speak a little bit more, but I'll turn it over. Thank you, Representative Bacalain. And before we move on, just I want to follow up on that. Um, Colonel, look, I share some of the same sentiments that, that Representative Bacalain expressed. And, it, and I had a couple of questions. So I, one of the questions is you, you talked about the culture of the state. And as you go every hour the culture changes. And so I really want to just know about the culture of state police though for a minute. You know, you're putting these policies in, but but do you have enough time, one, and two, what assurances can you give us that if you're not around in the next 18 months when the administration changes, that these policies are going to withstand the test of time, one. And then sort of as a, as a follow-up to that, if they can't, what assurances can you give us that the, the culture of state police won't revert to what it was at the time of the death of Ronald Green? Well, as far as our policies, and, and to be honest with you, a policy can be changed by a superintendent whenever a superintendent feels the need to change a policy. But when you're talking about changing culture, when you're talking about building compassion, building empathy and things of that nature, there's multiple ways by which you do it, not just by policy. You do it by putting people in place that's also going to carry that vision forward. And that's exactly what we're doing. I'm promoting people that share my vision. That's how you change the culture and continue to change. But you also start at the beginning. You start with the troopers that you're bringing on to your agency. You start with the first line supervisors. You move on to your mid-level managers and you complete that with your senior level people. And when they do not share that vision, then, of course, you try to change their behavior as it, was, as it um, is different. But when you're changing culture, you hit it from all angles. That's why I'm visiting my troopers. That's why I'm putting people in place that share my vision. That's why I'm implementing policies. That's why I'm sending our troopers out to training more than they have been in the last several years so that they can get some different perspective about 21st century in policing and as they bring that information back I challenge them to help us change the agency this is not a I change an agency this is a we change an agency but we're also working with the community to get their perspective their viewpoints and we bring that into our agency that's how we change culture and that's how we'll continue to change that culture that culture will continue to change because I have people regardless of whether I'm here or not that will also continue to implement that change and that's what's important. I'm not just looking at today. I'm looking at tomorrow. I'm looking at succession. I'm looking at the future of our agency, but also our communities, because I also live in our communities. I drive in our communities. I work in our communities. So does my son. So does my wife. And I want to make sure that we have the right people out there that's serving our communities, not just policing our communities. All right. Representative Hughes. Oh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Vice Chairman. Um, Colonel, I'm, I'm going to try to be as brief as possible, but let me uh, first associate uh, myself with the comments of Representative Bacala. Um, I totally agree with, with the things that um, he said. Uh, Colonel, let me let me first begin. You know, you've you've urged us to continue to support the women and men who uh, serve this great state as troopers. Yeah. And, and I couldn't agree with you more. But let, let me just reiterate that, um, you know, none of us on this committee want to be here. Um, we're, we're here because Mr. Green was treated not as a human being. He was not treated with dignity. He was not treated with respect. Um, and so you mentioned accountability being important to you, and I'm encouraged to hear that. It's important to us, too, and it's important to our speaker, and that's why this committee was formed. Um, to date, Ms. Molna has not been brought any closure. Um, and while there may be accountability moving forward, I will 
speak for myself and say there has not been much accountability to those that allowed this incident to happen from state police. And thus far, there's certainly been no accountability from our criminal justice system. I know that process is still taking its course. Um, but in my opinion, there's been very little accountability. And um, it's devastating that Ms. Molnar still can't bring closure to the situation. With that said, I've said publicly in the past, and I will reiterate it today, this heinous incident should not foreshadow the overwhelming number of women and men in state police who do their jobs admirably with commitment and dedication every single day. And I am thankful for the women and men. I have had the opportunity to interact with many of them who are just as disgusted and devastated at this incident as we are. And I don't think you'll find a more supportive group of people as you do in this room for our hardworking women and men in law enforcement. And, and I just want to reiterate to you and to all of the public, you know, in my district, um, you know, which is overwhelmingly African American, uh, I do reiterate to them that the overwhelming majority of women and men in state police are good, honorable, decent people. And I'll say that today and I thank them for their service. Um, you know, transparency, Colonel, I'm glad to, to hear your commitment to transparency. I will just say, you know, we have to be consistent, though, when we talk about transparency. We can't be selective. Yeah. And then the last thing I just wanted to, um, you know, touch on the implicit bias training for a minute. So important um, for, for those of us that have studied human behavior um, and bias. The truth is we all approach life with a bias. Yes, it's just real. Um, as policymakers, we have a bias in any profession. Folks look through the lens with some sense of bias. Um, is implicit bias training now required for every state trooper? And is it a one and done type thing or is it ongoing? Can you kind of walk me through um, what state police is doing with respect to implicit bias? So, yes, sir, it is required. And I, from the top down including inclusive of myself have gone through implicit bias training uh, we will continue to uh, keep that a part of our program because we think it's, it's quite frankly it's needed and it's beneficial to everybody in our agency so yes sir um, every trooper has gone through implicit bias training inclusive of myself and we will continue to train our personnel in implicit bias training as we move forward Great. Uh, thank you, Colonel. I might have uh, more questions later, but appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sir. Thank you, Representative Hughes. Representative Villio. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Colonel Davis, for being here. Yes, ma'am. And I want to thank my colleague, Representative Hughes, for his comments, as well as Representative Bacala and Representative Jordan. And, and I think we all do come united in, in this particular matter. Um, when Representative Bacala talked about the lack of communication between IA and the criminal investigation, that's a fact that there was a lack of communication. But the real fact, as I understand the testimony to this committee throughout the year, is that that communication was blocked, and it was intentionally blocked. As I appreciate the testimony to this committee, by Lane Barnum, and, and I apologize, I would normally use rank. Is it Colonel Barnum? Yes, ma'am, Lieutenant Colonel. As I appreciate um, the testimony of Lieutenant Colonel Bar Barnum, he says he made that decision. I suspect someone made that decision for him, but the bottom line is the investigation was blocked between the two. Now, I appreciate the Garrity warning as much as anyone, but the Garrity warning has to do with statements. It doesn't have to do with the findings of the investigation. And had that investigation and the separation from the two not been blocked, maybe the video, Lieutenant Clary's video, would have been found and given to the DA. Maybe Lieutenant Clary's video would have been found earlier and given to the United States Attorney's Office. We'll never know that, but it's a direct result of the blocking of the two. So my question to you is, 
have you um, determined that that was a system failure within Louisiana State Police? And if so, since the formation of this committee, what, if anything, have you done to prevent that from happening again? Thank you, ma'am. And I, I, while I can't speak to what Lieutenant Colonel sure. Barnum stated because I wasn't in charge at that time, I can I'm tell sorry. you that based upon my assessment, yes, that's a system block, a system failure because quite frankly, that's a decision that I should be making or someone at my level should be making with regards to that type of investigation. As such, since that time, I again, internal affairs reports directly to me. Forced investigations reports directly to me. They communicate without, of course, violating any of the Garrity rules. And allowing that and having that communication allows them to perform their jobs as they should. But I've also set in policies to ensure that when an, a criminal investigation that's initiated by us gets to a certain point, then that allows our administrative investigations to move forward. And again, there is no block. With regards to body-worn camera, we've set in uh, policies and processes to ensure that all body-worn camera and in-car camera systems and any other camera systems that's been introduced to a case is put into our system. And from there, certain people have access to that system. Now, when we have people that do not upload or miscategorize, then we hold them accountable. We discipline them. And that's to discourage them from miscategorizing, whether it be intentionally or unintentionally, it helps them do their job, which helps our internal affairs personnel do their jobs. But with the not only creation of our technology and business support section, we now have subject matter experts that understand and have the expertise to go by and look for certain patterns, look for certain cameras. So I've put in redundancy. And by having that redundancy in place, that is what helps us to identify fail points where someone, whether it be intentionally or unintentionally, miscategorized or didn't upload their uh, camera footage. And it's those processes that's going to help us ensure that we're going to have accountability. Because you agree with me, it's a, it's a matter of simply counting. If everyone is equipped with a body-worn camera, as I understand it, and or a dash cam camera, it's a matter of knowing who was on the scene yes, and, and then counting to make sure we have all of those videos, correct? That's correct. And when you look at some of the failed points, for instance, when the policy states that everyone that's involved in the use of force should fill out a form and not everybody's filling out a form, well, that may lead other investigators who's investigating that case to not have all of the requisite information to know where to go and get some of that footage. So we have, again, we have changed that information. We've changed those policies. We've changed those procedures to ensure that people are filling out the forms. They're completing their documents. They're uploading their cameras, um, footages, wherever and whenever by policy. And then we also have redundancy and having people that go behind and check and audit to ensure that we have all of that information. So the policies have been officially updated and or revised and distributed throughout the organization. Is that my understanding? But, yes, ma'am. But I can also tell you that as we continue, I have expanded my policy section and we're now reviewing policies from other agencies who have gone through and who have operated on best practices. So I can assure you that we'll probably continue to change those policies as we get newer, better policies introduced. Sure. And, and I appreciate that testimony. Um, what about you talked about potential mischaracterization of videos and, and you talked about having experts involved in all of this. Um, is there any effort to create a, a unified way of labeling um, videos, for instance, whether it would be based on an item number or whether it would be based upon a location of the incident, et cetera, something that the same the same fields are being entered into by all officers on the scene in the same way so that when you search for information in our videos, it's readily obtainable. Have we addressed that? Yes, ma'am. And we have a systematic way of categorizing it, but it still takes the officer to categorize the sure. video. Otherwise, it would just 
upload when the officer charged their device it would just automatically upload and may not have the same categorization so we have people when that's not performed in that manner and whether it be officers incapacitated or what have you if we know that that officer was on scene but yet we can establish a timeline then we can still have our auditors go and search for all audio or all footage to ensure that they're looking at all of it during that time frame. So it's not just about having that standardized categorization because that is being done. We have a standardized way to categorize a video, but still requires the officer or the trooper to categorize that video. And as I appreciate your testimony, if an officer does so incorrectly, you have policies in place so that there can be an internal investigation into that. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. It may be an internal investigation depending on circumstances, or we may refer that to be a non um, IA type case, sure. but it definitely will be reviewed. And, and can you tell us, um, is Lieutenant Clary still an employee of the state police? Yes, ma'am. Is he the only one um, who was on the scene that remains in the employee? Or are there others? I, he and I believe Corey York, but I need to verify that. And in what position does Lieutenant Clary hold in the state police? He's still a lieutenant. And Lieutenant, uh, is there any particular division that he oversees? Uh, he's he's in patrol. Patrol. Um, and has he is he one of the individuals um, that has received any type of promotion since you've become colonel? No, ma'am. Okay. Um, what specific policies? Um, one of the troubling um, issues that has also come to light is the system failure with regard to the wiping clean of cell phones. Um, certainly throughout the Las Vegas scandal, it was my understanding under Colonel Edmonston um, that, that that was a policy that was to um, be corrected. And, and yet we faced again in Ronald Green um, the destruction of what I consider to be evidence in this case, or arguably um, it certainly has left many to believe that there was the destruction of evidence. Um, can you state um, since this oversight committee was put in place what specific policies you've put in place to address that issue um, well with regards to how we sanitize phones and things of that nature we have um, put a policy upgraded our policy I will get you that policy to show you but uh, I don't have it right here thank you and, and Colonel Davis um, I know Representative Hughes discussed implicit bias training, and, and there's no question that implicit bias training is, is important, as is racial discrimination, as is racial profiling. Um, but in my opinion, and it's just my opinion, uh, what happened to Ronald Green on this night was not a matter of implicit bias as much as it was a matter of unlawful use of force. Um, and so with regard to excessive force and use, use of force training, I know that you mentioned um, that there is some changes um, in the training. Has, has, have those changes been implemented or is that something that y'all are looking to do? So I have uh, created a 15 person force investigative unit in which all of them have been trained and now are certified in conducting use of force officer involved shooting type uh, investigations. They have received great training from across the nation, uh, from Fletzy to some of the other better programs. And they are in place and they are now moving towards conducting. But conducting and, and I don't types. mean to interrupt you, but is that the top to bottom? I, I, I had a note to ask you who was doing, you mentioned the top to bottom assessment in your statement. Is that the team that's doing the top to bottom assessment or is that someone else? No, ma'am. Those are troopers that are actually conducting those investigations. My bot top to bottom um, organization is called the Bowman Group. The Bow Bowman B O L L M A B O W M A N group. That's the group that I have um, contracted with to do a top to bottom assessment. Have they begun their assessment? Yes, ma'am. Um, have they given any timelines on on what they intend to do 
I, I guess, do we have a contract in place that lays out the scope and the timeline for their service? Yes, ma'am. Is that something that's available to this committee? Yes, ma'am. I'll provide that to you after we leave here. Thank you, Colonel Davis. I think that, well, let me just ask you, um, any other policy changes, personnel changes, any, if you could just state for this committee in terms of, and, and it's certainly going to be important when we go to um, prepare a report of our recommendations, are um, any specific policies, personnel changes, uh, training, et cetera, outside of what we've talked about specifically today, um, have you implemented as a result of this committee's oversight? Well, ma'am, really, as I mentioned before, I really started looking at making changes beforehand. But while going through the committee, as well as while speaking with uh, the Bowman Group with regards to um, our assessment, we have made some changes. We've enhanced our body worn camera and car camera policy, which now expands the types of incidents that shall be recorded. I'll provide clarity to those the number of video reviewers by supervisors clarify that actions that will be taken when misconduct is observed and ensure that officers shall have their cameras on and ready to record at all times as dictated by policy. Uh, we mandated obviously implicit bias training. Um, we're also with regards to the body worn camera, all lieutenants and below now when they're in uniform, we'll have body-worn cameras on. And that's a change that we've made as a result as well. And I think that's beneficial as well to make sure we've got more coverage. And, and as we've seen in, in really recent weeks, uh, oftentimes without that body camera footage, you know, you're missing valuable viewpoints of, of what occurred. Um, we've looked at making changes and implementing de-escalation training and duty to intervene training at uh, all LSP and DPS commission officers in addition to our base curriculum. Um, we're evaluating the implementation of a discipline matrix and I think that's gonna be huge as well so that we can create consistency throughout discipline. I think people will be more, more adept to understanding and uh, making changes uh, to their behavior. All, as I mentioned before, and all additional to all patrol personnel, or criminal investigations division personnel at the rank of lieutenant and below have been issued body worn cameras when working uniform capacity. They will comply with the uh, LSP body worn camera policy. Our technology and business support section is uh, adding an in car camera and body worn camera check the box so that, again, we can have that redundancy in people making sure that we know what the supervisors know what to look for as well as our auditors. Um, some of the other changes is creating a standardized early identification system for consistent tracking. So our early identification system is a system whereby when officers actually, whether they get involved in pursuit uses of forces, complaints and so forth, that information is communicated back to us. Well, creating a system and a consistent system helps our supervisors identify troopers that may be at risk for performing some of these or having some of these behaviors that we have experienced in the past. By identifying that early, we can capture that before we actually get into a situation that ends in a tragic result. So it's very important for us to really enhance our um, system there, our early identification system. Um, some of the other things that we've worked with the post council to add supplemental information to the post employment status check report for terminations and involuntary resignations. And I think that's important because when we identify someone that quite frankly shouldn't be in law enforcement, we need to keep them out of law enforcement. And by providing that little checkbox, what it does is it now notifies other agencies that there is something that they need to look at before they hire this employee so that we don't continue to have them going from agency to agency. Um, We've implemented a duty to intervene policy since then, um, as well as expanded our use of force policy. So those are some of the things that we've done since, quite frankly, starting and, and really going through the changes here and, and really just having these conversations with you. As I mentioned before, um, I hate that we're here 
for the reasons we're here. But I can tell you, I feel good about the changes we're making, and I'm glad that we are making these changes because it is going to help us become the agency and really continue to be the agency that we should be. And Colonel Davis, my emphasis um, on since the committee began its oversight was not to take credit for changes versus when you implemented them, et cetera. It was more to get for the record, and I, I, I appreciate that. Um, it was more for the record of what has changed um, so that we can know what still, it, in the event we have recommendations for further changes, um, so that we could know to address in the report. Um, a couple of outstanding matters. As I recall, um, when we began the committee oversight, there was an issue of, um, for instance, Doug Kane's, Lieutenant Colonel Kane's phone, and I think that was taken for some type of forensic review, um, if I recall correctly. Um, can you update us on the status of, of that matter? Well, quite frankly, that is still at the Inspector General's level, and um, I haven't received update as of late. So the phone issue and 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 Lieutenant Colonel Kane, that is all still with the Inspector General. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much for appearing today. Yes, ma'am. And, and I, I would like to make one other change to what we've done since. Um, when we look at starting to create these changes, one of the things I noticed was it, it was kind of all over the place. Um, I've since created a professional standards section now um, that is going to help us organize these changes. It's not just making changes on a whim. We are actually organizing how we're making changes. We're keeping um, records of what changes we're making, and then we're looking at how they're impacting the agency. And, and as we do that, then we can go back, and if we need to make changes back or revert back, then we can. But I've created a uh, professional standards section and compliance section so that we can do a better job of, of categorizing and organizing our changes and not just making changes just because someone is telling us we need to make changes, but do it in a systematic manner that helps our agency and helps guide our agency. Thank you, Colonel Davis. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Representative Video. Representative Nelson. Morning, Colonel. Thank you for being here. Yes, I don't sir. need to beat a dead horse. I know my, my colleagues have kind of gone over most of this stuff. Um, just as kind of in the same line of questioning as Representative Vilio, would it be possible for you to give us some kind of memo that just outlines all these changes that you've made? And maybe if you've had time to see whatever impact that these changes have had so far since, you know, some of them might have been implemented a little while ago. But if you could maybe just give us a written document with all those things in there, it might be easier for our report and then also might be easier for us moving forward. That's the only thing I was going to ask, and thank you very much. Yes, sir. We'll provide that. Thank you, Representative Nelson. Representative Bacala. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, you know, I, I think one of the one of the things you have to do as an agency is go back and look carefully at this incident so you know what to fix. Uh, you know, and, and since you're working toward uh, those uh, uh, changes, I'm assuming that you have done so. You have looked closely at this. Now, uh, <laughs> let me just throw a few things out that you know we have had access. Uh, recently to to the journals uh, that were kept at that time a couple of points within the journals okay uh, 10 days after the incident there's a note that says in death in custody death dash review process question mark so all that tells me is there at on 5 2019 somebody's talking about what does the process look like? Because there's a question mark. Review process question mark. Two days later, 522-19, the, the top of the, of the page is titled In Custody Death, 9.30 a.m., I suppose. Then a note below it, video issue, review past videos, realize there's a problem, must address immediately with two asterisks. Issue to comply with policy on camera issued by captain. New note. Open IA investigation. 
uh, then a, an arrow, suspend pending, pending criminal, administrative leave, video audit of Hollingsworth history. If you go, uh, then that, you know, we, we, after that, there's not much in the notes for, for many, many months, actually until uh, 9-17 of 2020. Well, no, I take that back. There, there are some other. That was a different. But the point is, twelve days after this incident, it is obvious that people think there's a problem because it's discussed here, with the notes, administrative leave, video audit of Hollingsworth history. But the most disturbing thing to me is, and it's a question mark: open eye investigation, suspended pending criminal. Now. Right then and there, the message that I read from this is uh, let this guy or let whoever, whether, now look, maybe some conclusion hadn't been drawn yet about whether the actions were, were within the law or not, within the policy or not. So I'm putting this in perspective. But the fact that you're leaving open the option that we're going to suspend the internal investigation pending a criminal investigation does one thing it, it it leaves open the possibility of leaving horrible officers on the streets so i go back to the fact that the disconnect and 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 and, and you know you can fire guys who don't break the law you can fire guys for committing policy violations so there's two different standards but automatically, you're holding yourself to the criminal standard if you're not conducting an IA investigation, which could also hold them to the policy standard, which is higher. Uh, you go to, uh, you, there, there are some notes, but, but really the next significant notes on this case are a year and four months later. Significant notes. There, there are bits and pieces in there. But suddenly, you know, a year and four months later, uh, June 2nd, 2020, maybe less than a year and something. But anyway, that's the date. Suddenly, the notes start gaining again. But you know what's the top of the note that, that, that it seems to be driving this set of notes, I'm assuming? The first note on June 2nd, 2020 said FBI conference call with JBE 5 p.m. And, and suddenly we're talking about this now that the FBI is engaged. Uh, I could go through the notes and then 917 is apparently a, a real meeting takes place where in-depth discussion about uh, this case. Not until 917-20. I won't read everything to you, but point is, as you're reviewing, as you're going through the process of identifying what went wrong so you can fix it, <laughs> actually, we might have more information about some of this than you do, and I don't know that we have the ability to share this information uh, in more detail. I, I, we can decide if we want to go through this next set of notes there long instances where body cam was turned off one of those instances alleges he slapped somebody while uh, in a driver course uh, the traffic stops trooper assist not policing um, in car cameras unlawful orders yada yada it goes on and on but the point is nothing was done I mean, we can we can go through all the reasons and the policy problems and this, that, and the other, but the bottom line is people knew it was wrong or things looked very suspicious. I go back to the trooper who first reviewed the camera footage, you know, the, the uh, use of force expert, but nobody did anything, which to me is the most egregious part of all this is Nobody did anything. We don't know the motives for why. We don't know if it's bad policy. We don't know if it's 
intentionally trying to cover up. We don't know if it's just deliberate indifference. All we do know is nobody did anything. And even today, I don't know what remains open except the criminal investigation three and a half years later. I guess it's three, yeah, three and a half years later. Any comment? I mean, you gotta you gotta look back. So let me tell you. Let me ask you this: simplistic terms. Let's don't talk about CAD and, and this, that, and the other. In a in in a quick word, what went wrong, and how do you fix it? Leadership, 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 and accountability. Uh, and how do you fix it? Is you take ownership of it. We touch it, we own it. And me as the agency head. Whenever I put directives in place, whenever I put policies in place, then I enforce them and I enforce them consistently as I can. And from there, that's how we fix it. Do you rec- I just want somebody to recognize that time is important. Yes, sir. And especially when you have a, a, a situation where you might have someone on the street in your uniform, wearing your badge, holding your commission, who maybe shouldn't be doing so. How long does it take? to say, I'm sorry, you can't work here anymore. Sir. How long? How many days do we let them police when they shouldn't be in a badge? Now, that, that really is a question. I'm not, I'm, I'm just well, saying, what, I, what is acceptable now? And, and I mean, I wish, to me, two days is not acceptable. It is about the limit of what I would say is acceptable. Get in, look at the video. We're going to make a call right now. What happens? I know you guys have, when your policy is starting getting in the way, then they're in the way. I know there are protections and all that sort of stuff, but I'm just asking the question, and I'm, I really mean it. How long should we expect an investigation, an IA investigation, to take before you take, before action should be expected? I think there ought to be a standard. Well, and I think that standard has been created by the Law Enforcement Bill of Rights. And as far as making that decision, then we make that decision based upon all available information and evidence and facts. And I don't think that it's prudent for us as an agency here to make that decision at the time that I watch a video, because while the video provides a lot of information, it may not provide you all of the relevant facts. So I think it's important for us to go through, conduct a investigation to ensure that we get all of the available facts and information. And once we do so, then we make that decision and we let, whether it be the appeal process, the court process, take its place. Yeah. And I'm, I'm talking about two days, you're on desk duty till we figure this out. Are y'all doing that? I mean, if there, if there's an allegation of something and, and it's credible, I know there are a lot of incredible, but, but if it is credible, how long does it take before you say, turn in your keys, you're on desk duty? Well, as for me, if there is an allegation that makes me believe as an agency head that you're in danger to the public, I'm not putting you on desk duty. I'm putting you on administrative leave. I do not want you on any duty. And I think, uh, you know, some of the things that we talked about this in the prior meeting, I investigations that hang over people's heads for months and months and years and years are not fair to the public, and it's not fair to the troopers either. I, I think everybody deserves a quick resolution as quick as it can be within the Bill of Rights and such. But that's, uh, I, I just, uh, even the troopers don't like that, that, that you can be under investigation for months and months and months when, anyway, that, thank you, uh, Colonel. Thank you, Representative Bacala. Let me just follow up on, on, on what you're saying. And, and, Colonel, I'm so happy that you said leadership because the same person you read in the journal notes who's saying suspending the IEA investigation pending the criminal investigation is the same person who said that the actions were awful but lawful. So I think we need to make sure that we keep this in its full context and figure out so whether it was unintentional or intentional that we kept a bad officer on the street, we can all draw our own conclusions. But when you've got that attitude, I would tend to, to lean on the side that it was intentional. Representative Villio. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, Colonel Davis, without um, stepping, I, I've tried to avoid stepping into the lane of prosecutors. Um, but with regard to the video um, and internal affairs investigation, quite frankly, there are actions in that video that any prosecutor would tell you is unlawful, P. 
period, end of story. The first time you see it doesn't, doesn't take a law enforcement perspective, doesn't take a defense perspective, doesn't take a prosecutor's perspective. I think if you got all three in the room, every single discipline would agree that there are actions observed in that video that were unlawful. And so it greatly concerns me that based upon the way things were set up, that that trooper and or others were allowed to continue to be on duty when I get, listen, I am all for supporting officers and making sure you have every all of the facts in place before you meet out discipline. But when it is glaringly obvious that there is excessive use of force used, that there is no one who can defend it, that individual should not have remained in the employ and, and out in the public serving without having had some type of discipline. Um, so I think there has to be some consideration of that with regard to um, investigations going forward. And, and you're right. Um, it's, it's about taking them off duty. It's perhaps um, suspending them um, from the employee while the investigation is occurring. But you cannot leave an individual in the force and, and, and not address that for more than a year and expect to have the confidence from the public in the state police. And, and that's something that has to be addressed um, without a doubt going forward. Um, and, and there are many, Colonel, and, and, and I know this isn't going to come as a surprise to you, there are many that are going to say that a lot of this came about um, when, when you were in high command. Um, and I have no doubt that there are a lot of individuals um, who are questioning whether or not you are the one um, to be able to effectively implement these changes. And, and I hope, you know, time will, will prove those individuals wrong. Um, you are in the leadership. I, I take you at your word. Um, you know, and, and, and I certainly expect that, that there will be the changes that there are and will continue to be the changes needed to restore the confidence in the state police because the hard working men and women of that department, of which there are many, certainly far more than the bad apples, um, deserve that. The public deserves that. The safety of the law enforcement officers depends upon that, and the safety of the public depends upon that. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Villio. I think the board is clear. I just have a couple of questions for you, Colonel. Has anyone, uh, whether it be uh, D.A. Belton or the AG's office, requested any of the information from your investigations as it relates to Ronald Green? Yes, sir. We've turned over all of our information to the federal authorities, and from there they decided what information they have dispersed to whom from there. All right. Because, look, I know there's, a, there's certainly uh, the, the criminal aspect of this. There's the, the legislative aspect that we're dealing with. But I think if we're going to give Ms. Harden full closure, uh, there's also the civil aspect. And I just hadn't heard anything from that. So I'm just wondering, uh, and I'm assuming that that lies with the attorney general's office. Ha have they requested anything from you? Uh, not recently. No, sir. Okay. But they have in the past. Yes, sir. All right. Yeah. All right. Um, Again, the board is clear. I don't think we have any other questions. I, um, oh, hold on. Do you have any closing comments? I know this is enough worth hearing for you. I, I think you ought to have the opportunity, if you would, and even after the next witness, if you choose to. Well, and thank you, sir. Um, again, I know some people say it's rough for me, but you know, I think back to Ms. Horton and, and her family, and. You know, if it takes me sitting up here, it takes you to get the answers you need to get for us to get to where we need to be, then so be it. And I, I, I'm open to that. Um, Ms. Harden, and again, to their family, I am deeply sorry. Um, I can't think of how rough this is for them day in and day out. And, 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 and that's what's at the forefront of my heart and of my mind. 
So, um, me going through this, if it's going to make any part of their day better, I'll go through it. All right. Thank you, Colonel. And, uh, Per Representative Bacalan's request and, and, and my request, why don't you hang around and if sir. we need to follow up on any comments with you after Ms. Harden speaks, yes, we'll give you that opportunity. Yes, sir. All right. Our next witness is Ms. Mona Harden. Thank you, Ms. Harden, for appearing. I, look, I know it's always a, an effort for you to, to get here, putting it mildly, but we always appreciate when you come. And so I want to give you an opportunity to have any opening comments before you entertain any questions. Uh, thank you. Um, first and foremost, I just want to thank everyone, uh, this panel here. Uh, what I will say is... Um, What happened May 10, 2019, it's clear for all to see what should have been done uh, has been absolutely nothing. Uh, I agree and I thank you all for saying what you said. Uh, I couldn't have said it better. Thank you. Um, to say that for Superintendent Lamar Davis to say that he wants to move forward, but yet and still we still have Corey York, we still have Clary, those who were there when my son was murdered, to still be on the force, to be looked at like you're still a officer of integrity. I just don't understand how you can say this is an awesome organization, Louisiana State Troopers. What's happened with Ronnie is, is just a drop in the bucket. Uh, we all need to just be honest about what's going on here. And uh, the fact that it needs to be from the top down, you cannot have internal investigations done by those from within. You cannot investigate your own when those who are doing the investigating also have their hands stained. Uh, this is so obvious. Um, I was totally ignorant coming into this until it affected me. Um, I'm not dumb, I'm not ignorant. I'm a mother who saw her son being beaten purposely, tortured. I, I don't even understand how you can look your troopers in the face, they continue to have a badge, they continue to have a paycheck, they continue to be allowed to walk through as honorable. I, I, I just don't understand. You purposely turned a blind eye on what happened. That's it. Uh, I, I, I don't have the pretty words. I don't have anything other than what happened to Ronnie was murder. What should have happened has been not a damn thing, nothing. Uh, three and a half years later, it's it's been a long dragged out. The fact that you have the whistleblowers, you have people who came forward to say what they saw. You have good men and women of integrity wearing those badges, coming forward and speaking of what they know, what they saw, and continue to know. They they shouldn't be have to speak in fear. They should be able to step forward with ease, say what they see, what they know, in order to move forward, in order for the safety of the police, for, the, if for what you said, Representative Villio, the safety of the American public, uh, citizens. You have to do it. There's no other way but to do it the right way. You cannot sugarcoat, you cannot continue to go through state troopers with nepotism, favoritism, because that's clearly what's happened here. 
the fact that from the top down, the retirement of Reeves in the midst of this, the retirement of all the other officers, promotions, Noel, all them, the fact that Clary didn't even have a slap on the wrist. He condoned what he saw. This is where we're at. This is it. How it unfolds and who ends up answering for what happened to Ronnie. I, I'm sick to my stomach just thinking that I'm just still hoping that someone will pay for the murder of my boy. Um, my family showed a picture of him. Uh, my uh, immediate reaction was, why didn't that boy call me yet? I'm still in denial that my Ronnie was mercilessly killed, murdered. I, I sent my kids back a text, just that. I felt like picking up the phone, let me call this boy, he hasn't called me. It's denial because of what's happened since May 10, 2019. I've been in the trance. I've said that the last time I was here. Uh, that's the only way I'm able to function, and that's good. Because other than that, uh, I'd have completely been hollowed out. Uh, all I ask is for what's happening. It's just like they say, if it could have been done right the first time. Everyone was literally petrified to take the necessary precautions to fire these badass cops. They should have taken the necessary precautions to deal with it right then and there. But the fact that no one wants to hold anyone accountable, it says the significance of how deep this organized crime is. The fact that you got the DOJ over here, they need to really look, look in. And there's no way you can, the words that Lamar Davis, you, how can you say you're doing all the right thing when Clary is still here, York is still here? How can you say moving forward when you're still not being an effective superintendent? Uh, what's done in the past, it should not be overlooked and saying, well, I wasn't here then. I can't address that. We're talking about the troopers murdering a man, while he was still behind the wheel of a car, tasing with the intention to kill, he wasn't going to walk away. I saw that when I first saw that video. I don't care if it's 30 years from now, you still go back to that first day, you still go back to that first week, you still go back to that year. What happened in the state of Louisiana and what caused, what's the, the cover-up? that happened. I, I, don't, I don't care how many years you go past this. You go back to day one, to where we are, to when you decide to wrap it up. You're still going to come up with the same conclusion. And if you do not, then nepotism continues. The cover-up continues. Politics in the murder of Ronald Green continues. I hate like hell that there's backdoor deals being done. I hate it. It is what it is. I hate it. If the state of Louisiana, if you care about what's going on in your community, you'd go in. You, you'd make really credible boys clubs. You, you'd go in and, and you'd, with a fine tooth comb, let those kids know there's people out here that care about you. You're going to have your future. You know, you don't have to duck and dodge every time you see a police car. I have grandchildren that react that way. The youngest is seven. When he first started being afraid, he was, wasn't quite six. And that's a, scary, that's a scary reality of how my family lives, how a lot of family lives. I've been in connection with so many families who's lost loved ones behind police brutality. If 
there's changes that's being done, why does it continue? Why does it continue? Why hasn't it stopped? Why hasn't it stopped? And why are your bad apples still employed? All right. Representative Villio. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Ms. Mona, thank you for being here today. Um, one of the points that I found interesting, and I didn't intend to say it today, but it struck me when you're talking about um, the lack of discipline meted out to certain officers. Um, it's funny how I have been chastised in a written letter by counsel for the governor for statements I've made in this committee. I've probably gotten more um, than those officers have gotten in that regard, and it just struck me as odd. Um, but with that said, and, and referencing that letter, you made the statement when I first saw the video. And that's of particular interest to me today um, because we know from the um, from that letter to me and we also know from some press conferences and news articles um, that it has been stated that you and or the Ronald Green family and I assume that means you um, saw the Clary video back in October 2020, some six months before it was found in an, by an audit team and then given to the DA in the U.S. Attorney's Office. Um, and we've even had, uh, I guess it's a reality personality, if you will, um, saying that she was in the room and, and saw that video back in October of 2020. Can you state for the record whether or not you and the family were shown the Clary video Definitely. at that time? Definitely. We were not. We were not. The narrative was in total control at the time. Uh, when we did see that video, um, and my question is, if you doubt what I say, why is there not? There were others there. Could there not been a video? Shouldn't it have been a... Uh, recorded for sound or whatever during that time in order to have total clarity of who saw what and when. I don't, because I don't, well, I don't doubt you, Miss Mona. No, 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 I'm saying, you okay. know, to keep from going back and forth. Sure. You know, should there not have been a video in there for the fact that this is a government building in order so that we could just get all this talk? But no, we did not see it. Uh, Can you help me with the location of where when you were shown any videos, you were sh I'm only one time. One time, and where were you when that occurred? I was told it was the uh, EOC, the um, Emergency Operations Center. The, I really don't know. Okay. Uh, I was told that it was the um, the State Troopers Compound. Okay. I'm really not sure. I'm not sure. Do you remember who was present when the video? Who Edwards, was? It was uh, Edwards. It was Belton. It was a legal team. Um, it was, uh, the lawyer of Edwards, um, those that were in control of the video was in the table in the front. Uh, we were in the back. It was a, a just a row of chairs. Um. So the governor was present. Yes, yes. And, um. He introduced himself. Belton went into a whole spiel of what he's done and all his accolades. Yes, I remember that vividly. Were you aware that there was a showing of a video of videos before the family got to see them on that? It would seem to be that same day. Were you aware of that? We were told that they were viewing, and we were coming there specifically to see the video. Do you know who maybe had represented you? If there was anyone representing you or the family that was in the what one would refer to as the initial showing of a video or videos, do you know who would have been there? The initial showing before us? Yes, ma'am. Uh, I 
really can't. Okay, know. because as I read the notes in um, Colonel Reeves journal, um, which happens to be interestingly, coincidentally, don't know, um, actually the last notes he wrote in his journal in his career as colonel was that day. Um, and it talks about the video, it talks about the videos being shown to the Green family, but it specifically talks about the videos did not, the family did not view initial showing only attorneys. So were you aware that there were some attorneys that saw some videos before you got to view them? Uh, well, I'm sure, I'm sure. Okay. Because they, we were, me and my daughter was on the outside. We were put in a lounge, a coffee a lounge, a snack where snacks were. And uh, they were viewing it. Uh, we were there for well over an hour. Okay. And uh, we were told by the, by the legal team, if you don't want to see it, you don't have to. And uh, so we were on the outside. I could hear my son scream and I could hear all that stuff. So we weren't that far separated from the actual viewing. If you mean that, that well, would be. Well, I don't know, but for those in the audience, for those watching, um, for the governor's staff, for anybody who's watching this hearing today, when Phaedra Parks says that she took notes and therefore you, Miss Mona, saw that Clary video on October 14, 2020. There's an easy explanation to that, in my opinion, and it's what you said. You did not see it. Mm -mm. And Colonel Reeves notes back up that there were at least two showings on that day. Yeah, yes. Um, Phaedra Parks was there. We attended a lunch that was in her honor that day. Hmm. Uh, that was my first time meeting her. I was totally confused as why we were even in that event. Uh, but anyway, she ended up there. And um, uh, so she might have saw it at that time, but we did not see it. We were cut, that video when we saw it was cut, the very beginning, we were told, you don't want to see this, this is a chase. And my daughter said, we want to see the whole thing. So it was bits and pieces shown to us to where you can't say we saw the Clary. Uh, and they stopped it at their own will. We were not given the opportunity from beginning to end, no. Rest assured, Miss Mona, as Ronald Green's mother, I have no doubt that if you had seen that Clary video on October 14th, 2020, you would know you saw that video. Thank you so much for your clarification, and thank you for being here, and again, I am so sorry for your loss. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Video. Representative Hughes. Hold on, Rep. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ms. Mona, uh, first of all, thank you again for being here. Um, thank you for your courage um, and thank you for your strength. Um, you know, I, I will reiterate what I said earlier um, and, and you said it and I said it and I'm going to say it again. You know, accountability is a word that's often tossed around. But when you have individuals <laughs> that are still employed, um, that shouldn't be. You know, I've seen people fired in organizations for making comments on social media. But yet we have um, individuals that, that are still employed within the agency. And so there's a reason that the public continues, when they hear the word accountability, they continue to have skepticism. Um, because there, in my opinion, I'm speaking for myself, um, has not been true accountability and total accountability. It is my prayer that there will be accountability and that you can uh, achieve some sense of closure. Um, and certainly, uh, you know, I'm committed to that and, and, and I know many of my colleagues are as well. But I uh, just wanted to thank you for your testimony as always. And uh, just know there are many of us that will continue to journey with you and will continue to publicly fight to ensure that justice is served. Thank, thank you, you so Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Hughes. Yes, you can certainly comment. That, yes. uh, thank you for that. Uh, I have um, family members that say, Ma, um, they say, it was just not going to show. Why are you going to go? I said, this is for Ronnie. I, I have to. Uh, 
uh, the fact that I make that drive is no problem. No problem. We come from an Army family, no problem. You do what you have to do and you keep pushing. Um, I would not fail my son. I know what happened to him. He should have been able to live. They shouldn't have beat him to where they killed him. They murdered him. Um, but the fact that it's heavy, coming to Louisiana is always so damn heavy. The anxiety, I can't sleep, uh, the pain in my chest. But then I come here, and I see y'all here, and I'm good. Because I know I'm with people that care, the people that give a damn. Because what you know what you saw shouldn't have been. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Representative Hughes. I think the board is clear, Ms. Mona, but, but let me just, again, follow up on what Representative Hughes has said. We certainly applaud you for your courage and your strength in coming here. And, and, and I will tell you something that I've, I've told you privately before. Um, speaking for myself, but I think I speak for everybody. Um, you know, part of the concern, I know the concern was that this was going to be some type of dog and pony show and nothing was going to come out of that. And, and when we talked, I, I, I told you that certainly that if that was going to be the case, that I wouldn't serve here. And I can tell you, I think you see from everybody here, if that was going to be the case, nobody else would be here either. Um, we're going to do everything in our ability, I assure you, to make sure that there is closure for you as it relates to this portion of the process. Of course, we don't control the criminal process. We don't control the civil process. But from an accountability process of state police and to that point, uh, and, and the findings we've had so far and the ones that we're going to continue to develop, um, we're going to do everything in, in that's possible to make sure that, that there's some resolution to this. Um, again, we wouldn't be serving on this committee if we didn't think otherwise. And I can certainly tell you that is not only Representative Hughes' commitment, Representative Bacala, Representative Vilio Nelson, uh, Marcel and, and Landry as well, who, who couldn't be here today, and, and Representative from McGee, for that matter, the chair. Um, you know, it's, I, I'm, I'm just thinking about what Representative Villio said, and, you know, it doesn't, take, it doesn't take a lawyer, it doesn't take a genius to find out, to look at that video one time, and again, to, to see what happened should have never happened. And that is something that state police is going to have to live with and its legacy. And it's going to be a legacy of the state of Louisiana as well. And while we, we can't um, correct it in the sense of bringing Ronnie back, uh, we do have to own that and we do have to make it right. And in my opinion, we're nowhere near making it right. And so we, we have a ways to go, but as Representative Hughes said, we're going to be here with you on that journey, and, uh, and we'll be there until it's made right. Thank you. Thank you. I will say, as we come, uh, y'all's beginning statement is uh, as you come to uh, an ending uh, where you fold, uh, at some point everything has to come to an end. But to the point where... Uh, those that were over Troop F, those that were part of uh, how they received evidence, how they knocked down evidence, uh, uh, for all those that were allowed to retire, all those who were allowed to just fade into the sunset, and or be employed here, there, wherever, uh, lucratively, I might say. Yes. Um, what's been laid in front of me, and a lot of it is just there in the news. Uh, Louisiana has a lot to clean up. Uh, it's really shameful. It's really shameful how you allowed, and when I say you allowed, uh, uh, Edwards can't say he didn't know this. Reeves can't say that that's not my job. I left it to the sergeants. I left it to this and that. 
uh, you the 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 level of nepotism and. Uh, uh, I understand uh, everybody breaks bread together. You have barbecues. You go to golfing events, all this and that. That um, you just can't bring yourself to hold these bad good old boys accountable and the top brass for what's been done uh, for Lamar Davis to say he's doing all he can. Uh, it's like he's still in muddy waters. Uh, Clary should not be there. York should not be on payroll. No, nobody should. This is murder. This is murder, and it's condoned. Uh, I don't care how many times you don't make yourself available to these meetings. Uh, it doesn't wash your hands clean of what you know and what you've done. And I say that to all of those from the top down. Uh, how do you, how do you, why does anyone have to be subpoenaed to get the truth? Uh, and then when you're here, you can just lie. You can just continuously lie and uh, expect the panel to just take it. Uh, uh, it's really shameful behavior. Uh, it's made a mockery of everyone's time, payroll, what's happened here, a total mockery. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's really in bad taste, and it's really, really foul. 2022 going into 2023, uh, it's disgusting, it's disgusting, and I don't care how many times those May 10th washed their hands of blood, they did not. It's still there. All right. Thank you, Ms. Mona. I'm going to give the colonel an opportunity to address. All right. He doesn't. All right. So he's declining. All right. So, look, with that being said, um, we don't have any announcements at this time. Uh, I will get with Chairman McGee, McGee to figure out and coordinate with the governor's office to see when we'll have him scheduled, and as soon as we get that date, I'll be sure to let you know. And um, thank you. And we'll move forward from that. All right. If there's no other business, I'll entertain the motion to adjourn. Okay. Representative Video has made a motion to adjourn. No opposition. We are adjourned. Thank you.